Well, greetings once again. It's a beautiful day in the Wild West, and it's time for another Notes from the Turning Shop, the August edition. August 2020, it's amazing that time marches on. Well, it is. Now, let me see, where do, where do I start here? Um, I'm going to do a shout out to a local wood turner who's been involved in the Yellowstone Wood Turning Club for many, many years. That's Stan Lambert. Yesterday I went up to the uh, beautiful town of Huntley, Montana. It's about 30 miles from here in, in Stan's shop. And we uh, spent part of the day cutting up some, some ash logs that we uh, acquired for the club. And anyway, Stan does a great job. He spends a lot of time doing stuff like that that's really hard. But anyway, Stan... Thank you very much for being there. I've got one of the questions that I'm going to get to, or maybe it's a comment that I'm going to get to here. Um, if you have this particular issue of the American Wood Turner, and you go to page 18, um, there is a log holder for chainsawing. And it's a really cool design. I really like it. Uh, Anyway, the reason I'm mentioning that is somebody had a comment on the one I have. You know, do you have plans and all that kind of stuff? Well, no, I don't, I don't have plans, and I'll uh, maybe comment on that a little bit later. But anyway, the pictures are not very big, and I'm not sure if I can take a picture uh, and do it justice. But on page 18, uh, look in this magazine, American Woodturner. Yeah. Now... We live in different times with the COVID and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we're not meeting in different wood turning symposia around the country. And a lot of clubs are not meeting. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. It's a little bit up in the air. So we are challenged to face some new technology. Myself as a demonstrator and a viewer, I spend some time watching on YouTube and, uh, you know, different wood turners. One thing that happened yesterday. Now, yesterday was uh, August 22nd, okay? And that was a virtual craft festival that was put on and organized by our friend Carl Jacobson. And I promise the next time they do this, um, I'm going to advertise a lot better for it because it was really pretty cool. During the day... Uh, they had to spread out from 2 or 3 in the morning Pacific time in the United States. But that's uh, 7 or 8 hours later in England and Europe. So it was kind of spread out. Anyway, Martin Sabin Smith, Zach Higgins, and of course Carl Jacobson were some of the demonstrators. This was a live streaming uh, event. Now, what does that mean? And I think we need to look at some terminology. Um, live streaming simply means this is done through YouTube. It can be done through Instagram or, or whatever. It's kind of one way. You see the demonstrator live and you can also ask questions through a chat. You know, just type something in there and he'll see that. The demonstrator does not see you. Now, something else we're looking at for 2020 that's a little bit new and and probably more popular and maybe more well known to clubs and wood turners around is the interactive remote demonstrations and I like to use the word live live remote demonstrations and I'm uh, setting up for that I've got a few scheduled I've got one under my belt New Jersey wood turners um, and one of my videos I just put up I'm finishing a piece that I started in that live remote demonstration. All right, anyway. Um, live remote demonstrations are a two-way street, okay? They do that through Zoom, and the demonstrator can see you, you know, in your little webcam on your computer if you want to. You can hide that if you want to. Um, you can... Also, speak directly to that demonstrator. That's a little bit different than live streaming. Uh, I need to investigate live streaming because I've never really even thought about doing that. 
All right, let's take a look at uh, some comments and questions. Now, most of these comments that I've gotten are from the last couple videos. I haven't done a great job of getting back to people. I apologize for that. I just had lots going on, and I, I'll try to do a better job in the future. Anyway, Tim Pollock. I hope I'm saying that right. I can mispronounce names with the best of them. Um, hey Sam, do you have a link for the screw chuck you used? Do you remember the brand? Now, I'm going to put up a link. Uh, I actually found it on the Craft Supplies USA website. That's where I bought that. It's a dedicated oh, okay. screw yeah, chuck. I thought, well, I might as well just show that to you. Uh, I've got a little waste block on that. I think I was using that for a drive center, a drive block. So. Um, I've also got a little spacer that I typically put on, but there is the dedicated screw chuck. You know, it's worth, uh, I think it was $45 or something. It's really handy. It's all set up. Uh, you can put that on your lathe spindle. And uh, it's a quick way to uh, start a project. All right. Thank you, Tim. All right. Um, all right, now I am working on a video where I use Ron Brown's ladle chuck. And I'm pretty much completed with the ladle. I've got a little hook on the end of this where I can just, I can kind of hang that. It's just a feature. I can't get it in the shot anyway. The very bottom of this is maybe, maybe two or three millimeters. And trust me, it's really thin. Anyway, that's an upcoming video, and I'm happy with that. And I will highlight Ron Brown's ladle chuck, which is really cool. I use the, the little spherical templates to make this part round right here. But that was a fun project, and I may make a bunch more of these. All right, now somebody asked me about rough turning bowls. And I'm not sure who this is from. I don't have the name down here, but anyway. Sam, if you turn it too thick, he's talking about a bowl blank. If you turn the bowl blank too thick, you said you'll have problems. Okay, um, here's a, a nice, I don't know, that must be 17, 18 inches in diameter. That's a nice bowl. Uh, and I think I did a good job. Uh, this was actually cored, cored out, because I can tell from that inner piece right there that it was cored. Um, this is probably an inch and a quarter wall thickness here. Sometimes you guess just right. Now, here's the issue. Too thin, too thick. So if I go too thick on this, let's say I do two inches. This wood needs to move as it dries. As it dries, it's going to change shape. It's going to go oval. And if you can see the tenon on this, you know, it's really, really oval. So you have to make that tenon uh, large enough where you can reduce it and true it up again. So that one turned out pretty good. So too thick, it's not going to move and it's going to split. So you got to be careful with that. This one, um, this is one of my favorites. This has been sitting in the dust for, I bet, 20 years, maybe. Nice piece of walnut, but if you can see that, it's really, really gone oval. Well, it, the wall thickness is probably 5 eighths of an inch. I made it too thin. So there's no way in the world I can put that back on my lathe and turn it. It's just too thin. Um, these walls right here, these go in this direction, so the pith is right here, I can tell. Once I get that turned down to true, there won't be anything left to those walls. So too thin, too thick experience. That will guide you. All right, thank you very much, whoever wrote that. My old friend Valerie Henschel, thank you very much for always watching my videos. I really appreciate it. Um, 
Oh, good comment. This was some of my chainsaw work. And yes, I don't cut very straight on my chainsaw. Oh, okay. She commented about the pith cut, taking the pith out of a log. And, and that's good because if you, if you leave the pith in too much in a, a bowl like this, here's, here's the, the center of the tree, in this orientation, here's the pith. And the pith is, is like ran out here someplace. So I've removed the pith from this particular bowl blank. All right, so when I put that back on there, it, it will be less likely to split in this area. Now, if I take a piece of, of wood out from right here and the pith is in here, Valerie made the comment that what you have is uh, quarter sawn wood. Okay, excellent point. And if you have a big enough log where you take off uh, that much wood from the pith, and you just remove the pith, I'm, I should draw you a picture, but anyway, um, you can actually have a couple little uh, projects from, from that pith area, because it's nice quarter sawn wood. Yeah, excellent. Uh, and she goes on and gives me some good advice about using my chainsaw. Uh, I think the way I hold it gives me kind of a crooked cut, but uh, I don't know how important that is. I do okay. Enjoyed the video as always. We had to cut a giant elm in our yard. Can you tell me what type of elm you were cutting? No, I can't. Um, our club has been uh, cutting up some elm and also some ash and the elm just didn't quite smell like the elm I'm used to. Uh, it was elm. I don't, have no idea. I have no idea what kind of elm it was, but it was elm. Because it smells like a wet dog. I would like to know what is the ideal moisture content you like to hide. All right, this is from John. For Lazo, John, I would like to know what is the ideal moisture content you like to have to do in the final turning. Um, well, you know, if I have a bowl, and this one, I don't know, I don't have a date on here, but this has been sitting around for a long time. It's absolutely dry, probably some moisture in it, but it's uh, the equilibrium moisture content is set to Montana. It's been sitting here for a year was in Wyoming for a long time. I suspect the moisture content in this is six to eight percent. Okay, if I finish this bowl and send it to Ohio or Pittsburgh or Texas, which is very humid, it may have problems. It may take on some moisture. So really, in answer to the question, what's the moisture content? Um, What's the ideal moisture content? Well, it kind of depends on where you live. Um, now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump to another comment I have someplace, and that is, you know, if I seal this wood, and I had a video a while ago where I was sealing some, uh, some logs or bowl blanks or something. What do I seal? Well, I seal everything. I seal inside and out all the way around. If you live any more humid part of the country, if you're blessed with a little bit more moisture than we are blessed with, um, sometimes wood turners will only uh, only seal the, uh, <laughs> I'm looking for the pith, only seal the end grain. So they'd seal this part right here, and they'd seal this part right here, uh, and maybe the inside, but leave the rest of it alone because in some parts of the country, it's a little bit more humid than it is where I'm from. And somebody suggested that uh, I set up a computer or a tablet on the other side of my chainsaw work so I can see where I'm cutting so I can cut straight. Not a bad idea, but I probably won't do that. And finally, uh, this is a comment on truing up an untrue sphere. Nobody likes an untrue sphere. Am, am, you know, am I right? Um, here's my take on 
making spears. It's fun, and there are a million ways to do it. You can uh, mess around with uh, you know, doing it freehand totally. You can set up jigs and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, probably 20 good ways to do it. And what I used in that uh, video were some templates I got from Ron Brown's ladle chuck. Okay, and I used those. Well, I wanted to use them. So this comment from Charles, uh, I think you overcomplicated the process with math, curves, templates, and calipers. Okay, and he, and he uh, brought up Alan Stratton from As Wood Turns, and Alan's a friend of mine. He does great videos, and I've seen his spear videos. They're excellent, okay? Just a different way to do it. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Um, you know, I'm a robust lathe dealer. And I'm involved in a robust stock lathe program, which means I can set aside a lathe that's all ready to ship. Now I've got an American Beauty, it's got a three horsepower motor, the tilt away tailstock feature with the gas shock, and that is ready to ship. It could probably be in your shop in a week or 10 days. Anyway, you have to go through me, okay? You won't get this lathe if you go through Robust. You have to contact me, and I'll put my email up, samandcheryl at gmail.com. Uh, get a hold of me. You know, if you're dying to buy a Robust lathe, they're pretty cool. I thought about getting it and putting it in my shop. Ah, my wife would find something to hit me with. So I better not do that anyway. I'd rather have you have it anyway. So.